is found in the book of Psalms. Chapter number 22. I will be reading verses 1 and 2 and verses 6 through 8. I cannot wait to hear the sermon from this scripture because it is a very hard scripture for me to read. I'm very passionate about this part of the Bible and what this scripture is talking about. So, bear with me. Psalms chapter 22, verses 1 and 2. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? And from the words of my roaring. O oh my Lord, O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. And in the night season, and am not silent. Verse 6. But I am a womb, and no man, a reproach of men, and despise of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delight in him. Christ. 
because he is so, and there's so many O's I can't count them, he is so awesome. In him there is peace for my soul. I know God loves me because his word tells me so in many ways. He provides for my needs, his many blessings, right down to every breath and step. He gives grace to change and to choose. I know God loves me because he gives me hope for a future. His comforting words soothes the soul. Jesus died for reconciliation, i.e. salvation. He lets us know what's ahead. I feel it. This is why I know God loves me. I feel it and sense it. Many times I see it. I picked out Psalm 22 and those verses specifically because I want to ask you a question. Who are those verses talking about? Are you sure? Because if you pull it up on the internet, you're going to get a thousand different uh, ideas. There was a man on there who said he doesn't believe in prophetic prophecy at all. And so he couldn't see that speaking of Jesus. But I want you to look at those verses and be familiar with what they're saying because we're going to look at the Gospel of Matthew. And I want you to see just how accurate those verses that Lester read are when it comes to the narrative of what took place at the crucifixion. And this was written a thousand years before the event took place. So turn with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 27. Do you know what the world's going to celebrate on the 20th of April? That's right. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to think about what you hear this morning, and I want you to think about that great day, the resurrection day, and what that means for you as individuals, and what it means for the entire world. Turn with me again to Matthew 27. I also want you to think of what it was like for Jesus himself. Have you ever put yourself in his shoes? these last hours of his life, what he went through, what it meant to actually have the choice to say, no, I don't want to go through this, and at any moment he could have said, this is enough, I want to go back home. But he chose to go through it for what reason? Love. Love. What kind of love is that? I also want you to think of this. Psalm 22 was written a thousand years before this event. Okay? So you know for a thousand years before Jesus and the Incarnation had that time because he inspired David through the Spirit to write that down. So you know he was thinking about it. Right? I want you to understand this. That is Jesus God? Yes. Is he eternal? Yes. Does he have a beginning? There you go. Thank you. Trick question. Does he have a beginning? The answer is no. He is eternal. He is the I am that I am. From eternity past, that thought is in his mind. Before humans were ever created, that he would do this. And when he would create this planet, that he would die for us. And he would bring reconciliation. Can you imagine what his thoughts were when he looked into the eyes of Lucifer? And he loved that angel. And he gave him great power, great beauty, great wisdom. And he loved him. And realized that he would be the cause of that suffering and that death. Gary? We've been doing some studies at home and 
from what we've been reading, some of uh, spirit and prophecy, but it says that he could not see through the portals of the tomb. While he was on the cross. Yes, and he thought that he would be uh, eternally separating himself from his father when he died. Mm. And he was willing to make that sacrifice anyway. He was willing to give it all up just so you could be there. Even though he might not have ever saw you again, the sacrifice would have been enough to keep him there. Matthew 27. Let's look at verses 11 through 14. I looked at all four Gospels and I picked Matthew on purpose. Because there's one text in here that has always, before I started to understand it, raised questions of why. Why would he say this? But Matthew 27, verse 11, says, Now Jesus stood before the governor. What was that governor's name? Pilate. Pontius Pilate, right? Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? That's pretty direct, isn't it? What was Jesus' answer? It is as you say. So was Jesus the king of the Jews? Did Jesus know who he was? Yes. Did he know what his mission was? Yes. Why did he not answer the scribes and the Pharisees when they accused him of all kinds of things? It says that he stood before them as a sheep that was dumb. But when Pilate asked him this very direct question, Are you the king of the Jews? What was his answer? Yes. It is as you say. Yes, I am. I am their king. Now, brothers and sisters, I want you to understand how deep and dark and deceitful sin is. Because when Jesus, or when Pilate asked this question to Jesus, were they separated or were the scribes and the Pharisees who were accusing them in the same room? They could hear what he was asking him. And when he said, yes, I am their king, They wanted to kill their king. Not just their king, but the Messiah. He wasn't like David. He wasn't like the other hundreds of kings that came before him. He was their king. The king. The one and the only, and they wanted to get rid of him. What motivates that? Sin. Do you understand the depths that sin can bring you to? If you think you can control it, realize that the answer to that is no, it will control you. Amen. And it will destroy you. Amen. It is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he did what? He answered nothing. And then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? This is why I asked you, were they in the same room? Because if you read that text, it gives the inclination that they are all standing there in one place. Okay? They heard. And as soon as he said that, they started to accuse him of many things. And he answered them, nothing. Nothing. <laughs> then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he answered him, not one word, so that the governor, what? Marvel, he was greatly amazed. Now at the feast, uh, let's go to uh, verse 19, for time's sake. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, this is Pilate, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent to him, saying, have nothing to do with who? With that just man. Who was she talking about? Jesus. Some versions say that innocent man. Okay? Why did she tell her husband have nothing to do with this just man? It tells you a little later on in the verse. Because she had a dream and it disturbed her greatly. Greatly. 
Why did she have this dream? Here is something to think about when you're talking to somebody that believes in uh, predestination, like R.C. Sproul. Okay? Why would God give Pilate's wife this dream to have nothing to do with this judgment if he didn't have the freedom to choose whether to move forward with this or to submit to the will of God? If your destiny is all planned out and God saves who he will and he loves who he does and he hates who he hates, why would he go to the point of giving this woman a dream to say, stay away from this man, do not condemn him because he is just and he is innocent? Did God love Pilate? Yes. And did God want Pilate to be saved? Yes. And God was giving Pilate one more chance. Was Judas predestined to be a Judas? Did Jesus work on Judas's heart to try to convert him? Again, there's something else for you to talk about with a predestinary. God so loved part of the world? So what does the text mean that God loved Jacob, but he hated Esau? He despised Esau. Why do you, hold on, why do you say despised? Because he denied the, the no, and You used the word, you used the word despised, right? Right. He said he didn't, he didn't hate him, he despised him. Why do you say that? Because he, he, uh, he didn't want the bloodline coming through him. What does the verse say in the scripture? Hate or despise? Uh, it says hate. But the, so uh, this is what I'm asking you. Is that a bad translation? Yes. Despise is a better word. Yes. Okay? Yes. That's what I'm getting at. Yes. Okay? Why did God despise Esau? Because Esau despised God. Amen. Right? Esau did not care about the birthright. It meant nothing to him. Now, let me ask you a question. Does God have his children? Yes. Does Lucifer have his children? Yes. Right? What makes some people choose God and what makes some people choose Lucifer? Say loud. That's it. It's their word choose. They choose. If it's predestined, there's no choice in that, is there? Predestinarians would love to tell you about the overwhelming grace of God that you just can't run from it. That's great as long as you're one of those that God chooses. But they never talk about the downside. That if you're one that God hates and despises and you really want to know God, but you can't because, hey, you're just not on the list. They don't understand the end half. Exactly. Anyway, that was just a side road. Sorry. I'm getting back on course. Took a little detour there. I was listening to that this week. It drives me crazy. Okay. Uh, we're looking at verses 19 through 26. While he's sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent to him, saying, Have nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for who? Yes. And destroy Jesus. Who? Who persuaded the multitudes? Satan. Persuaded the multitudes because it was, and you'll find this earlier on, I skipped those verses. It was the custom of Pilate to release one prisoner before the Passover. And he had a multitude of prisoners. Was there only Barabbas and Jesus? How do you know that? Well, because there were two other thieves that were crucified with him. Right? Now, why didn't he ask if one of those two guys wanted to be free? Because they were, no, they were followers. They weren't leaders. Right. Jesus was the king of the Jews. As you said. And Barabbas was a leader as well. What was Barabbas in jail for? 
murder and insurrection, sedition. Barabbas was the one that cross was made for. Did you guys know that? Did you ever think about that? The cross was already made. It wasn't like, okay, well, we got Jesus here. You go down there and make one really quick. It was made already because it was meant for Barabbas. Because Barabbas deserved it. They made three crosses because three thieves and a murderer were going to get killed. For sedition. You know what sedition is? Insurrection? Standing up against the government. Treason. And that deserved the highest death penalty that Rome had, and that was crucifixion. Now you show me and you tell me from Scripture, what did Jesus do that was sedition? Absolutely nothing. This is why Pilate said, I find no fault in him. He's done nothing worthy of death. Nothing. You ever wonder why Pilate said, so I'll just have him scourged. No, I'll release them to you. Pilate was a politician. I'm looking in the back and I realize, wow, that's not the same cameraman that we usually have. <laughs> Are you going to try to stay in one place? Okay. I'm looking back and going, man, that, that's not the same guy. That's <laughs> Do you see how dark and how powerful Satan had control over the scribes and the Pharisees? Now, if you ask them, because didn't Jesus tell them at least once, if not more than once, who their father was? Who did he say their father was? The devil. The devil. And they said, you're the one with the demon. We know who our father is. Okay? Do you see how far and how low you will sink if you give yourself over to sin? <laughs> These guys were the teachers of Israel. They were the holders of God's truth. They were the pastors of the local church. And their God comes and they want to kill him. Did they know their Bible? Did they know the scripture? Yes. They taught the scripture. Mm -hmm. So understand it. Knowing the Bible doesn't mean you're going to be saved and it won't keep you from sin. Amen. Yeah. What keeps you from sin? Amen. And you get that by making a choice. And you submit and ask God to come into your heart. Do you think those scribes and those Pharisees and those leaders ever asked the Holy Spirit to come into their heart? I like that. I like that. And many times in many of his, let's just say, discussions with them, it was about their interpretation of the word, right? Yes. So the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said to them, Which of these two do you want me to release to you? And they said, What? Barabbas. Now believe me, who do you think Pilate wanted to release? Jesus. Why didn't he want Barabbas? Because Barabbas led an insurrection already. That's why we don't want terrorists to lead, right? If we lock them up, we want them to stay locked up. Because they'll go back and they tend to do the same thing over and over again. You release Barabbas, he's going to do the same thing. And he looked and he questioned Jesus and he said, I find no faults in him. Pilate said to them, What then shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? And they said to him, What? Now, if I remember right, weren't they just throwing palm fronds down and their coats underneath 
so he could uh, ride his donkey on top of it? Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think that there was nobody there calling for Jesus in that crowd? <coughs> there had to be some. Because don't you think the one leper who turned around that was cleansed, don't you think he was there? Don't you think the parents of the ones that he raised from the dead, the children, don't you think they were there? Okay. But it tells you that the scribes and the Pharisees persuaded the people. They had, do you understand this? These men who worked for God were so corrupt that they had the baser elements of society on their payroll. Right? Right? Yes. And that when it came time for whoever Pilate said he needed that, the scribes needed to have more people to say Barabbas than Jesus. Who did they get? The rabble. I like that. Now I want you to see how Satan controlled these people as well. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took water and he washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am what? Innocent. 